Uh, hi, good evening uh, here in Brussels and uh, good morning on the other side of the world. Uh, it's me again. Today I want to do uh, something on uh, uh, symmetries in nature. And uh, if you do something on symmetries, then you know uh, we, we also have to talk about asymmetries. You know, and this weird phenomenon that is referred to as a symmetry breaking. Uh, what kind of uh, symmetries do you have in uh, modern physics? Um, let me do that out. Well, you have a uh, charge. A charge seems to be, um, you know, we have positive charge and negative charge and a lot of processes when you swap the charges. Uh, uh, the positive charge by negative charge and the negative charge by positive charges. You will still see uh, the same... Um, or a different, uh, slightly different, but a, but a phenomenon that is real, that exists uh, in nature. Um, then they found out, um, especially when you go to smaller scales and high energy physics, um, where you have, you know, particles disintegrating and uh, recombining into stable constituents again, that, um, you know, some processes didn't, did not take place when you swap the charges. And uh, they wondered why, and they said, well, um, we also have parity. Parity is, um, has to do with uh, chirality. Uh, you know, a lot of things in nature, um, you will know that particles have spin, uh, which is a weird property. But for me, it's not so weird. It has to do with the direction of rotation. And um, well, I won't talk too much about that. I think a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of misunderstandings arise um, because uh, this phenomenon of rotation, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, uh, it, it may be more fundamental than uh, you know a thing going in this or that direction um, to explain certain phenomena. But then they uh, they discovered also that you know uh, okay when we uh, swap the charges, when we change the uh, direction or rotation or um, you know, officially, uh, parity is defined as, as a flip in a spatial coordinate. Uh, the x direction of travel becomes the minus x, or the y direction becomes minus y, or the z uh, becomes minus z, or two spatial coordinates get flipped. Um, you know, in some cases, uh, Kaons in particular in the 60s, they saw that, uh, you know, the combined C CPT symmetry uh, was, was broken. And so then the solution was, um, well, there is another symmetry, uh, reversibility, basically. So reversibility uh, has to do with um, you know, time reversal, I guess, right? So we reverse a certain process in time, and we go from the end state to the, to the beginning state, and we swap uh, the time coordinate for minus t, and then it was said, you know, okay, fine, um, the combined CPT symmetry is uh, conserved, and you know we can have symmetry breaking CP or PT, uh, but the combined CPT symmetry will always be um, preserved. Um, I wrote a few uh, blog articles about that uh, ten years ago. I'm, uh, I'm looking at them at another computer from so that in 2014. And um, I thought I should revisit those. Um, uh, why? Because I, I wrote them at a time when um, I did not have this uh, quite wonderful uh, classical interpretation of what um, electrons and protons might actually be. Uh, you know, uh, small things with a structure, uh, charged oscillations, and, uh, you know, it comes with a sort of a, a mass generating mechanism, as I explained in my previous lecture. So um, I started to think about quantum mechanics in a whole different way when I realized that, um, you know, the particles are not infinitesimally small things that have no structure whatsoever. Um, no, uh, it is a rotating charge or, you know, a much more uh, a rotation within a rotation. Um, maybe I can show that um, for an atom. I oh, know I did. I did not make that. Um, that's in my other notebook. In any case, you you can imagine that you know you have a, a nucleus and then they have 
you know, um, the uh, electron, you know, I'm, I'm just inventing here an orbital, um, the complicated orbital, but that electron itself is, you know, a ring current with um, a theta bewegung charge inside of the smaller uh, core. Uh, we think that core is there because you have a phenomenon that's called elastic scattering when I send photons in. You know, they might hit the nucleus, but the nucleus is very small. It's kind of rare that it's going to interact. It also has to do with the fact that we think protons and neutrons have a different structure than these ring currents uh, that are electrons. But sometimes it will hit that hard core um, charge inside of the electron. And, um, and so when you start thinking about these rotations within rotations, you understand that um, in, in these equations, you all kinds of weird um, 720 degree symmetries, for instance, pop up because while you talk about the frequency within a frequency, uh, compare it a little bit to you know, like the precession uh, frequency of you know a rotating charge in a magnetic field that will have a different frequency and so um yeah often uh, in in 3d space uh if you you look at what happens um when that thing goes around uh, 360 degrees you know the secondary uh, frequency inside of that thing uh maybe may have you know a different um uh, spin direction and after another round if it's half the frequency, it will return back to its original state. So when you think about rotations within rotations, you can have all kinds of uh, uh, weird symmetries. Uh, when you think about the rotation of 180 degrees, 360 degrees, you know, things will not exactly, uh, you know, the, the system will not exactly be in the same state as you thought it would be because um, there's more complicated motions underneath. Um but so yeah, I um, I'm already sort of digressing. Uh, let's let's talk about symmetries. Uh, the the articles or the blog articles that I uh, I wrote a long time ago, I should redo redo them. Um, weirdly enough, got the, um, got a bit censored. Um, they said there were too many diagrams from uh, Feynman lectures in. Uh, really, the MIT. I got his message. Uh, said I was copying too much, uh, which I thought wasn't true. You know, you need a standard textbook on physics to illustrate things and show why you think that, um, you know, the explanation in them is, uh, it's not that it's not correct, but that it leaves out certain aspects and certain physical aspects of the situation and that you think, like, why, um, why don't they talk about that? And... Um, so I want to talk about these things and sort of to approach the, the, the topic of um, symmetries. Um, I thought I would go back to that idea a little bit and, and think about, you know, what, what, what kind of symmetries exist in, in space and, and what about that time variable? Um, you know, what does it mean to, to reverse time? Is, is that possible at all or, or, or not? So um, what I'm going to ask you to do is to think along with me and, uh, and then you can see what makes sense and what does not make sense. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do is, um, you know, to look at, uh, uh, at this here. Uh, so we have a clock, mm, a regular clock, and it goes in the, uh, you know, it goes clockwise. And we're looking at it. So it goes from 12 to 1 to 2 to 3 o'clock. And then we have this other weird thing here. And uh, you may think... Uh, I'm asking you, uh, is this a mirror image or or uh, what is it? It's clearly, you know, we did something with, with its symmetry. We re we reversed some, um, we reversed something. Uh, clearly we reversed the, um, well, we did not de reverse the direction of time. It still goes from 12, you know, to 1 to 3. Um, but so what is this? Would this be a clock that you look in a, um, that you hold in front of the mirror. Let me clean up my notebook a little bit, as far as I can do it. Um, I can't go back all the way, apparently. Um, I, I will tell you sort of, um, you know, when you, it's, it's funny when you Google um, a mirror image, uh, you, you will find most of all well, left uh, becomes right and, and right becomes left in a mirror. Um, maybe. I, I, I have here a 
uh, a real mirror image of myself with a book. Um, so I will I will explain and and talk about that mirror image and ask you to to think about it. Um, <clears throat> Well, you might think that left becomes right and, and right becomes left. Huh? Uh, let me go to this mirror image, actually. I'm holding a pen in my, uh, in my right hand um, when, I, when I took this image. And you, you see, well, I have myself here in the mirror. Um, I, myself, as an object, you know, I have a front and a back. Huh? My nose here is in the front. And so... Um, yeah, based on that, I can say like, well, my right hand, the right hand of the person in the mirror is uh, is that one. And so now he's holding his, well, my pen, well, it's his pen now. <laughs> these are the funny things. You, you you will laugh when I explain this story. But it's a, it's not a simple one, actually. It's, um, you, you know, the, the, the reason why I'm, I'm um, doing these funny things is actually, uh, you know, I will ask you a very basic question and I will answer it for you also is um, this person in the mirror could he possibly exist and you will say of course he exists he is there right that's my mirror image and this person moves and um, because I move but could this be a real person so the first funny thing that we have is um, yes left seems to be to become right for him because, you know, from his perspective, in his reference frame, in the reference frame of the mirror, uh, he, his right hand is there. Uh, and that's on my left side. And uh, he seems to be left-handed because, you know, he's holding the pen in his left hand. So, um, but that's possible, huh? You can have uh, left-handed people, right? Yeah, that's possible. So the person in the mirror, and that's already a fundamental difference, is uh, so he may or may not exist. Uh, well, it's a mirror image, yeah? so let's be clear, he doesn't exist. Huh? That's not me, that's me in the mirror. But um, can we imagine that world in the mirror? And I uh, say, so, well, yeah, 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 that would be like a, a, a Martian, and if he would walk out of the mirror, then, um, you know, the only difference would be that he is uh, left-handed. And, uh, and I am right-handed, so um, th that would be nice, actually, if he walks out of the mirror, I could already say, like, um, you know, I could distinguish him and, and me just by asking, can you write something down, please? And then he would take his pen in his left hand, and then I know I'm right-handed, so I would never confuse my twin. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really joking, but there's, there's a serious, um, um, there's some, some serious physics behind it that I would explain in a moment. So, um... Le left seems to become right. Eh? Also, the title uh, of his book, um, you know, it's uh, Gauge Particles. So what is it? Gauge Theories in Particle Physics. That's the title of the book. So, um, yeah, there are also, I see, uh, well, to read his language or his writing, um, I would need to read from uh, my right hand side to left. So, not from left to right, but from right to left. So, um, yeah, well, but that's okay in uh, Arabic and I think uh, in uh, in Yiddish or what is the, the Jewish language, they, they write from uh, right to left, if I'm not mistaken, at least in, in Arab uh, they do. So that, that's not a problem. This person is uh, left-handed. He reads from, uh, yeah, my my right-hand side to the left-hand side, so he, he, he reads things uh, differently. Um, and so it's just, uh, yeah, the characters also, you know, uh, left becomes right. So, yeah, really. Um, <clears throat> the interesting question is, if you want to really wonder, could this man exist, um, is, um, well, where, where would his heart be? My mirror image, uh, my heart is on, on the left-hand side. So my mirror of which, if I would, uh, if this would be like a special mirror that through which I can only see um, my own, um, you know, by by röntgen, röntgen uh, uh, radiation or something. So I would I would see his lungs and his heart pumping. Then um, you know my heart is on on the left hand side, so his heart would also be you know pumping um, uh, here, right? And that's his right hand side. 
So that's why you really wonder, like, the, in the, the person in the mirror, he can't walk out, he's not there. Um, well, he's a, yeah, he's a mirror image, but he, he can't be real. He can't be, um, unless we assume there's a whole race somewhere outside in the universe that, um, you know, has uh, their heart on, on, on their right-hand side. So th this is the thing, actually, uh, that you need to realize. When I look in the mirror, um, you know, my mind will... Um, Will 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 put itself in 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 the brain of this um, person that he sees, and um, you know we would tend to think like uh, oh this this is a mirror world, but somehow you know when we when we mirror things um, they they could be real, um, but as you see you know it's not a left becomes right and we have sort of a, a left handed. Well, that's the thing, actually. We we have sort of what we see really is a left-handed world in a way, um, not because the mirror swaps left. And this is my right-hand side. No, because actually everything that is on my right-hand side, um, you know, uh, the photons <laughs> they go to the mirror, they come back. Uh, they're, they're still on the same side. So it's not a left-handedness or a right-handedness swapping left and right in in a sense of uh, um, my reference frame, but the reference frame that my mind automatically associates when it recognizes something that looks similar but actually can't exist. And I will explain you now um, why it can't exist. And for, for that, I, I, um, I will explain that... Um, you know everything in um, every physical phenomenon, uh, the the way we describe it mathematically, like an example that I'm here giving here, uh, the magnetic force, for example. Uh, uh, this is the formula for the magnetic force. You know that from the the Lorentz force is the charge multiplied by a vector cross product of the velocity of the charge and the uh, uh, magnetic force. I illustrate that uh, here. You know we have a charge Q. Uh, going in this direction and uh, the magnetic force the field uh, we have a magnetic field an external magnetic field uh, the velocity of the charge is there the magnetic force uh, we know that it's a sideways force um, will be in this direction not in this direction why because we um, this is the formula and uh, you know to the direction of a vector cross product is given by what we call the, the right hand rule uh, this is my right hand one finger um, uh, is the B vector, so that's the uh, magnetic field vector in this case. One is the velocity vector, and you know the, your thumb will give you the direction of. Um, so we have these left-handedness and right-handedness, and of course, this right-hand, left-hand rule. Um, you know that this is what um, when you express that in coordinates, huh? when we say the velocity vector is a vector, huh? and, and we have three components eh? and the, in, in the x direction and the y direction and in the z direction um, that, that only works oh, we're gonna have a product also here eh? a magnetic uh, field in the x direction eh? or a component and a bz um, that only works when you really have what what we call a, a regular um, coordinate frame we need to watch out and not do just what we want to do a right-handed frame um, you know we will have the right-handed rule if we have a z direction and um, well actually if we have an x and an y direction we choose that then we apply the right hand rule it's like uh, you know our fingers will um, will give the direction and when we have our fingers our, our, our fingers give the direction in which we should rotate our x-axis to fold in the right direction with the y-axis and then our thumb uh, from our right hand um, from our right hand will give the direction of the z direction this um, if we would put the z like this uh, then then this is a left-handed frame and then you know our, our mathematical rules to when we express vectors in um, you know, in coordinate, uh, in in coordinates and components, x, y, z coordinate components, then uh, it would not make sense anymore. And so um, that's all fine. That's easy. Uh, and then you can think, yeah, we can uh, swap spin. Uh, the we can swap an axis, and x uh, becomes the minus uh, x, and 
and uh, we can do all kinds of funny things. But the, the main thing to remember is that, um, you know, we will have an actual clock and we can think about how this clock is going to look when what, what we are doing here. Um, sorry, what we are doing here is actually we walk around this clock and we look at it from the backside. Or, same thing, we rotate that clock um, uh, 180 degrees. So um, then we stay where we are, but we rotate that object uh, by 180 degrees, and this is how it's going to look like. And so, uh, yes, if we are careful about the math, and um, then the same physical phenomenon, uh, a clock that ticks in a clockwise direction will look uh, like a clock that ticks in um, a counterclockwise direction. So... Um, that's all alright, and with most physical objects and particles, and uh, we, we can just do that. We can say, well, when we walk around that particle, or we, you know, uh, rotate that, that particle 180 degrees, uh, that is how it's going to look like. Then we have a lot of, um, you know, transformation formulas. Uh, quantum mechanics is full of that, of the, you know, a, a new perspective on the wave function or whatever you want to call it. And um, we apply this and this and this formula and then we have, uh, you know, uh, a wave function, new wave function that describes that behavior um, under uh, some uh, rotation uh, in, in a new reference frame that has been rotated along the z-axis or along the y-axis or along the x-axis uh, by 90 degrees or by 180 degrees um, or by 360 degrees where I said you know if you have rotations within rotations um, you know that can become uh, quite complicated the thing however uh, and this is uh, where I'm coming to the point is um, the main reason why I know that the mirror world cannot exist physically is um, you know thinking about a photon so this is a um, This is a photon, uh, usually uh, gamma is used as a symbol for a, a photon. Um, it goes in the, the positive uh, x direction or z direction or whatever, you know, it goes uh, along uh, uh, one direction and we conveniently choose that direction to um, coincide with the um, direction of motion of our photon which is an object um, as you know the idea of a photon is um, is it's a field it's not a charge it's really point like um, not unlike protons and electrons that have some size a photon might have some size but you know it's going to be very very small there's discussion going on and are, are photons really infinitesimally small um, I don't think so I think things that are in infinitesimal or small that have zero dimension whatsoever don't exist so I think a photon must have, you know, some some very small, incredibly small dimension. Um, it doesn't matter. We will probably never know. I said there are uh, experiments going on, uh, photon on photon scattering experiments. And sometimes it does seem that, you know, a photon hits another photon and gets and both uh, get uh, scattered in different directions. Um, I haven't looked at these experiments, but uh, it doesn't surprise me um, that sometimes um, this might happen. Um, and it's going to be a rare event because, uh, yeah, if it has some size, it's going to be very, very small. So let's think about something very, very small, which is only uh, defined or characterized. What are its physical, um, um, physical uh, characteristics, I would say? Well... Uh, uh, if we would place a charge, then we know some electric force would be uh, on it, and there would also be some magnetic force uh, on it, which is here. But, uh, of course, I said we, we don't have a charge, so what we have is a field. A field, what is a field? A field is like a force without a charge to act on. So a photon uh, does not carry charge. There have also been experiments like maybe it carries, you know, a very, very, very tiny charge. No, um, I think it's pretty conclusive. Photons do not carry charge. They are a traveling uh, field or a disturbance of um, a traveling disturbance of the of, of an already existing elect electromagnetic field. And so what happens basically, and this is kind of weird, the energy of a photon is packed into this um, 
you know, electric field vector and a magnetic field vector. And um, it, this is a linearly polarized uh, photon, not a circular one. If it would be circularly polarized, uh, then this electric field vector would uh, go round and round and round around its axis. But no, um, this one goes up, grows, mm, as it as, as it does. You know, the photon is always, this is very important, it's always somewhere at some point in time. It's not, you know, it, it, its linear fetcher is really the cycle um, that it goes through. Um, so the electric field vector, you know, as it moves, uh, becomes uh, larger and reaches some maximum, uh, and then max, max uh, electric field. And then it becomes smaller again, and it becomes, well, negative. Uh, the, the magnetic field vector um, points in the opposite direction. And then, you know, this is the full cycle uh, for the electric field vector. And then, uh, you know, it starts a new cycle. So the linear fetcher is in the fact that, um, um, you know, the electric field vector goes from zero to its maximum, uh, back to zero to some minimum, which is negative, and then back to zero. So you could say that over a cycle, well, this thing, um, the average is zero. Um, at the same time, and uh, this is the funny thing, is, uh, you know, we have Maxwell's equations in, in uh, when there are no um, charges going around, no, no currents, then Maxwell's equations reduce to this, you know, the curl, uh, you know, that's a vector operator to give some kind of this. This is circulation of, um, of the electric uh, field vector given by, uh, you know, the time derivative of the magnetic field with a minus sign, very important. Uh, by T, and then the magnetic field vector, uh, you know, is the circulation of the magnetic field vector or the curl is given by um, the time that, and so you have that, that's how a wave, um, you know, propagates, we have some circulation of B, so B changes um, with time, and so that gives some circulation of the magnetic field vector, and that in turn, because that Field magnetic field vector changes. Um, it gives some change in the magnetic field, and so on and so on. So that's the perpetuum mobile, how um, an electromagnetic wave propagates in space, or a photon propagates in space without, um, you know, apparently losing energy. And so it's a it's a very. Let me clean up a little bit. Um, I hope come back all the time. Oh, it's, okay, it stops there. Um, so it's a dirty picture. Um, well, it's a clean picture. It's a, it's a nice thing, but a photon is indeed weird. Its energy is over a cycle, mm, over a full cycle, uh, uh, going up and down and then up again. Over this full cycle, you know, that's, that's the photon energy uh, given by, you know, we, should, we would have to give you the formula for the field energy. There's going to be some square of the magnitudes uh, integrated over um, that distance here. And because it's a square, the energy of the photon is gonna be positive. I'm not gonna dwell on that. The, the main thing that you should remember is that the energy is positive. Huh? And negative energies, we, we talk often about negative energy states, but, uh, but energy is actually positive. Um, it, it depends on your reference point uh, whether it pops up as a positive or a neg negative charge in your um, uh, quantum mechanical equations but think of energy being positive because you know it's um, an oscillation of um, an electric and a magnetic field factor and as we know the energy is always proportional to um, you know the amplitude of the oscillation uh, the length of the of the vector times the uh, uh, frequency squared. And so it's proportional to the um, both the square of the amplitude of the oscillation and the um, uh, frequency. And this is where, you know, when we have a charge, we get this, you know, we know that the mass is going to be generated actually by an oscillating charge with a certain amplitude and a certain frequency. But, you know, I referred to previous lectures on that. Um, with a photon, we have zero rest mass, so the mass factor is not there as a proportionality factor. Uh, there is zero rest mass. 
uh, it acquires mass, you know, an equivalent mass because it has a positive energy. But to make a long story short, um, because I'm, I'm talking too long and I need to get back to my, my mirror here, if I would fire uh, a photon, and actually, of course, I do that to see the image, uh, there's light on that mirror and that gets reflected. Huh? And that's why I can see things. But re imagine that there is no real boundary um, and that my photon goes through the, the, the surface and really would hit um, that book uh, or the pen. And I could sort of, uh, you know, I would have photons uh, that allow me to, uh, to really see <clears throat> the objects in the mirror world. So... Uh, then it's no longer a mirror image, of course. Then I, I imagining some real world in the in the what well, is the, the world in the mirror, but that I'm observing really, and that you know when I can send photons to it and I can see it, then you know I could probably also walk into that mirror and uh, and then that that world would be real, right? So, but for the moment, I can only think about um, you know let me test if that if the person in the mirror exists. Of course, he doesn't. But um, <laughs> let me explain you why, uh, because it's physically impossible. The person in the mirror, he would do the same thing, right? He would send uh, photons to me uh, and, and try to see me. And then he, hope, he hopes that, uh, you know, when sending a lot of photons, uh, a lot of photons, some of them would bounce back, uh, uh, would, would scatter um, back uh, and, uh, and show him which color I am. What am I doing? You know, I'm holding a book. The thing, though, is um, if he would send a photon, think about this, reverse it. Um, his photons wouldn't 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 be physically possible. Why why not? Think of linear um, uh, linearly polarized photons. You know, for his photons to work, because we have this asymmetry, I would say, you know, the magnetic, the real electromagnetic force and fields, um, you can see that the magnetic field factor lags. We can say it, um, there, there's a right hand rule for the um, uh, electromagnetic force. And of course, I need to define very clearly what I mean with the direction of rotation. Huh? So the uh, I. Is counterclockwise and minus uh, i is clockwise. Huh? That's the imaginary unit as a, as a rotation operator. And uh, it happens to be this way that, um, you know, here you can apply a right hand rule also, put your thumb in the direction of x, and then, uh, you know, your fingers um, will go from the e vector to the, the magnetic vector. And, um, you know, you would see I have to make a an angle of 90 degrees, and then I get my uh, my magnetic field vector, and of course the magnitude is um, um, much less than the electric field vector. But that's that's sort of a question of uh, of units. Um, we could take a uh, different time and um, and uh, distance units so that c becomes one, right? And and also velocities uh, said in this formula, the velocity matters a lot. So things that have um, you know high velocities, velocities uh, of of c. So don't don't worry about these magnitude magnitudes and um, just think about the, the the magnetic field vector is um, is as real as the electric field vector. Uh, of course, they combine into the Lorentz force. Huh? It's one force uh, q times e plus uh, q times this magnetic. Um, field vector right um, it's one force but uh, you know in our reference frame we we can uh, distinguish uh, an electrostatic uh, force between two charges and uh, and a magnetic force on a charge um, so um, <clears throat> his photon would also you know if 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 this person could exist if we apply the the right hand rule um, He's full, he see the magnetic field vector of yeah this is kind of hard to know, but it would be uh, perpendicular orthogonal to the uh, uh, propagation of direction of of his photon and it would be a left-handed uh, photon you know the the magnetic field factor would precede uh, the um, electric field factor by 90 degrees and so we know that um, 
the mirror image of our photon um, you know that that would be uh, an impossible um, that would be the same that would also sort of have a you know a left becomes right the um when our when our photon um goes into the mirror it comes back uh there the, you're gonna see it's um it can't uh once it enters the the surface of the mirror and goes in this world um you know it's it's a weird thing the uh, the left handed force the, sorry, the right-handed electromagnetic force suddenly becomes a left-handed one, and the, the same uh, is for him. Actually, his um, the photon that he's sending towards us is not a mirror image of um, of our photon uh, because of that fundamental asymmetry uh, in the electromagnetic force itself. So. Um, I should have prepared this a little bit better. I will let you draw it um, yourself. But you can verify this and, and think about it. Um, there's a lot of things that are wrong with, uh, with the world in the, um, in the mirror. And, uh, and it's not about, you know, a human being suddenly, um, you know, all human beings in the mirror world are left-handed and their heart is, uh, you know, when, when, when we look at it, when they walk out of the mirror, their heart is not on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side. And um, uh, But the main thing that is wrong is that electromagnetic phenomena, like um, the photons that we could imagine to uh, leave uh, from you know his body uh, and coming to us, uh, they would not respect um, the laws of uh, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, they would respect the law here. With a plus sign it's like an anti-force and uh, we know that anti-forces don't exist um, I need to make um, a, a very hypothetical and, and revolutionary and nuanced uh, statement at the same time um, and you're really gonna think I'm a, I'm a crackpot theorist now I've been thinking you know the um, one of the most spectacular discoveries from astronomical observations is that actually there's a lot more uh, matter and energy in in the universe when we look at the um, uh, you know the orbital motions of galaxies um, and how they they um, they attract uh, each other and turn around each other is that apparently there's a um, I don't know details of it but there's a lot more matter around the problem is we can't see it and um, it doesn't send out any radiation that we can capture and um, and that's why we call it dark matter or dark energy it's not antimatter it's 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 something else some something completely else and um and nobody knows what it is and i've been thinking um you know perhaps that's the um that's a world that is governed by a left-handed uh, electromagnetic force because um mathematically we could construct a, a, a universe that is a uh, that has Maxwell's equations, uh, observes Maxwell's equations, but you know where where there's a minus sign, uh, we put the plus sign for um, the way um, photons, radiation uh, work. And uh, my feeling is that um, you know we would never be able to uh, detect such radiation because you know the handshake is different, and uh, you know the magnetic and electric field factors, uh, which I, I will talk about it when they. Um, when they line up and we have something like, you know, an electron and a positron uh, annihilating each other, um, you know, there's like a handshake there and the electric and magnetic field vectors are aligned uh, in opposite directions or in the same directions and we can just add them. Uh, if, if uh, you know, a photon uh, would, would, would meet with um, another photon that is right or left-handed, you know, you never have such nice lineup the superposition um, principle wouldn't, wouldn't work. So there, there's no handshake. Um, I'm kind of vague about this because uh, I said this is a, a hypothesis which I had not had much time to develop. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that I keep in the back of my mind. The main thing I want you to remember is that um, is this the mirror images, hmm? pure mirror images, 
uh, it, it's not physically, you know, it, it, the world in the mirror doesn't exist. It is the world in the mirror, and uh, and and that that's what it is. Now to come back to uh, CPT uh, symmetry, um, said I think they they miss a lot in terms of um, what what is possible and what is not possible, uh, especially that thing where. Let me go to the next page. You know, this is like the classical Feynman diagram of a pair <coughs> um, annihilation uh, in this case, or you know, pair creation. If we reverse the process, we have uh, a positron and we have an electron. And the first problem is already that uh, well, an electron basically is a positron, it is an electron, but that moves back in um, in time. Because this is sort of a space axis, uh, um, should be in three dimensions, but you know, imagine this as a sort of a, um, a thing that helps you to, um, to say, like, it's moving in a direction in three dimensional space, and now we have time. So, this is the first thing already that they say, like, basically, you know, a positron is just um, an electron uh, moving back in time. Um, really. I'm going to show you something where, um, you know, where, where CPT symmetry, according to me, is uh, which shows the nonsense of the thing, actually. So let, let's imagine that we have and uh, we, we make a movie of, of two um, positrons uh, moving away from each other, right? This is what is what we're showing here. And, um, you know, it's just a normal movie. Huh? We, we don't, we, we first make the movie and then maybe we can reverse it in time we can play the movie backwards um so let's now um do what uh, according to cpt symmetry you know if we reverse the arrow of time um but let's do that later let's let's first reverse the charges so we would have um electrons rather than positrons and then we also uh, move um you know the direction so these um these electrons, uh, you know, we would see them uh, move um, towards each other, and that's not um, that's not normal because two like charges will repel each other. So the physical picture should be uh, that they also move away from each other. Huh? They have uh, a, a, a like charges, and uh, so they repel each other. But I would say, well, you know, um, CP symmetry clearly is not conserved here. We have symmetry breaking, so we must also reverse uh, time, and then, you know, we play the movie backwards, and then we see this thing indeed happening where two like charges, um, you know, um, move towards each other, despite the fact that they repel each other. I'm I'm joking a little bit, uh, but you will so, you will see that this is um, you know some kind of gymnastics of the mind that is uh, you know not not very logical. Uh, time goes in one direction only, and uh, you know that has nothing to do with um, uh, things you see in a movie that is playing being backwards that are not logical. Like you know an egg, you break an egg and then. Um, uh, you reverse the movie, and then somehow magically uh, your your um, egg and bacon uh, becomes bacon and a nice egg again, rather than a mixed up uh, whole of uh, white and yellow stuff and bacon uh, pieces of bacon. So um, that's entropy, right? Um, or you could say I play the movie backwards, and suddenly I see that in this gravitational field of the Earth, um, things are flying upwards instead of falling down. Um, no, my argument is really simple. Uh, space and time are both two categories of the mind that are related to each other through the idea of motion. Something moves in space and time, and this is why time can only have one direction. You can see that here in this, um, you know, I have a trajectory here of, uh, you know, let's say a charge uh, that uh, accelerates. Uh, uh, it has pretty. It has a, no. It decelerates basically. It has a high speed because it covers a lot of distance, you know, in very few time. And then uh, it decelerates and it reverses direction. You know, it goes back to a point in time, uh, a point in space where where it was, uh, 
um, you know, quite a while ago. And then we the, imagine this curve would do something like that, go backwards. You would say uh, that's physically not possible. Why not? Because, well, at one point in time, this thing is at uh, one, two, uh, maybe three, four, four, five different um, uh, positions in space at the same time so that's not a logical function that's not possible we know that and that's why you know this is a weird uh, motion as well i said a high speed you know it decelerates go back to where it was uh reverses direction again uh reverses direction once more and and so on and so on uh, but that's a regular um function we we can imagine that yeah this is a very weird motion and we don't know what fields and and what things happen to the to the particle but in theory it's possible that our particle would do this this is something that is physically uh, possible and logical uh, this no so um any image that you see Feynman diagrams and whatever where something gets explained by saying well you know this particle um because it's a very special thing and CP symmetry doesn't apply, so we reverse sort of the arrow of time. Um, the, the thing basically is that the arrow of time, um, you, you can't reverse it. What you can reverse is indeed, you know, spin directions. And so I, I, I like to think about pair uh, creation and annihilation. Let's take uh, pair annihilation as, um, you know, what, what might be happening. I'm not sure if that is what is happening. But uh, it, it might be this. We have an electron uh, and we have a positron. And uh, we know that um, when we think of a, an electron, we have a small charge inside, a hard, hardcore charge. Uh, and the, the, the positron as a whole is basically, you know, a little ring current. And, uh, you know, the radius, sorry, the radius, this thing is going to be equal to uh, h bar divided by the mass of the electron uh, times c that comes out of um, a very simple equation you know um, when we think about mc square uh, the energy is mc square and it's also equal to h bar and we think of c as uh, you know an orbital um, velocity so it's going to be the radius vector times the frequency vector so c is going to be a w um, sorry, a uh, omega, then omega uh, uh, c is, uh, oh, I hope I can drive it again, uh, I know a is going to be c divided by omega, um, omega is the energy times, is over, um, you know, h bar divided by the energy, and uh, we're missing this c, the c, yeah, times c, this c is still here, and so the energy is mc square, h bar c falls away. So that's how we get the radius directly out of, um, you know, the mass energy uh, equivalence relation and the Planck-Einstein relation, and thinking indeed of an electron as having some structure and being a ring current of some very small, tiny um, um, uh, core charge. Going back to the um, uh, how they could meet is, um, you know, we uh, let, let's think about it not in terms of a wave function. We could use a wave function representation, but in terms of sort of the the forces that act on, uh, you know, there's uh, this this very small charge, and um, and the force that acts on this, uh, you know, uh, electron, the small charge, and then the whole thing. Um, you know, the the charge is gonna give rise to. Um, uh, well, if you have a ring current, actually, you will have a magnetic field, right? And the magnetic field, the, these are the field lines that I draw here. Right? They go through um, uh, through the center of the ring, and there will be a north and a south, right? And uh, we know that for the positron, we have the same thing. Um, well, everything is going to be the same. Magnetic field is going to be the same. Uh, if the Tittebewegung charge... Uh, goes in the opposite direction and we will also have north here and south there this is important because this north south um you know it defines the magnetic moment 
And what I think is that the magnetic moment uh, will line up um, just before they meet. You know, imagine these two electrons, well, the positron and the electron coming together. And, you know, they before annihilating, they will probably dance around and line up their magnetic moment. And probably they will want, because the charge is all in this point-like thing, they will want to sit right on top of each other, right? And that's then where, indeed, when, when that happens, when these two ring currents come together, and they line up uh, the magnetic field, and the two charges are going to sit on top of each other, then we can add the forces and we can think like, uh, you know, uh, what happens to the energy? Why? Because the energy is, you know, energy is force over a distance, right? So if we know what happens with the forces, you know, we can, uh, we can add energies, but, you know, let's first... Um, add the forces to add the forces of course the forces they act on a charge so the charges sh should be you know in the same uh, physical uh, position in 3d space so that's why we assume here that um, you know maybe maybe not always it's, it's a hypothesis um, that um, you know in the short brief moment uh, you know that an electron and a positron uh, might form a positronium it's in very unstable um, temporary combination of two opposite charges and so we think uh, that's what happens during this very short uh, this uh, short time that this this equilibrium state as i call it uh, exists the positronium um you know the magnetic moments will be lined up and the charges will really literally uh, sit on top of each other and so then we can uh, add the forces so what we get is that for the first force on the on the positron um, you know, that's the positive, uh, I could, uh, to make it clear, is the unit charge, QE, where the E is more elementary here rather than electron. The elementary charge, um, QE, uh, the positive, times the magnetic field vector uh, that is acting on the on the on the on the positive charge on the positron and uh, there's also the magnetic force which is going to be very very important because the scales are so small and the velocities are so high uh, this v is actually c we assume that this charge is sittering around at the speed of light so um, that's why the magnitude of um, it's all magnetic force actually and if this if there is an, uh, an, ele an electric field vector then its magnitude is going to be uh, the same or at least the same um, so these these uh, one over c uh, factor doesn't play so uh, but that would be the force right uh, uh, the elementary charge times um, the electric field vector and uh, and then a magnetic force which is defined by the uh, positive elementary charge uh, times the velocity now what happens of course is in this titterbewegung model is um, the force um, on the uh, electron yeah is going to be opposite but what it's going to be it's going to be well minus hmm? uh, it's a negative charge so it's going to be minus um, qe i will make it later. and it's going to be minus um, E. So, of course, minus minus uh, makes plus. You see what I'm doing here? It's sort of like I take the elementary charge, um, you know, for the electron, it's going to be minus the elementary charge. The um, forces are opposite, and uh, the electrostatic, uh, they, they attract each other, right? Positive and negative charge uh, attract each other. So, the direction of the, electro, uh, the electric field vector is opposite. So, we have minus minus. And um, and then for the magnetic field, uh, for the for the magnetic field, the magnetic field is the same uh, actually. Um, it goes in the same direction. See the B vector for uh, these two uh, ring currents is the same. So B um, doesn't have doesn't get a minus sign. Uh, v does because we said this. Uh, elementary charge inside of the electron goes in this direction, and for the positron to get uh, this, this magnetic moment lined up, you know, the ring current will be in the opposite direction. So we have a minus V and we have a minus um, the charge. So again, there it becomes plus plus. So then we can uh, simply add these things and uh, it, it kind of makes sense. And then it, it, it doesn't actually. What we can write is that, um, oh, we have two times Q, two times the elementary charge uh, times um, the magnetic field vector. And then we have two times, um, I know when we add that once and second time here, uh, two times the um, elementary charge times uh, the velocity vector C, uh, I should write C times B. 
Um, and that's, uh, that's great, huh? because we know the magnitude of B is 1 over C times the magnitude of E. So um, we, we can add that, and we get something like, um, um, well, 4 times the force. Um, Well, let me see that too. Well, I, I sort of don't compare. No, because the, yeah, the magnetic field vector and the electric field vector, I don't add them. I should actually apply the, the right-hand rule and see if this sort of vector uh, is in the same uh, direction maybe as E, then I could add both. Um, and then I only have one field strength. It should be actually because uh, it's the Lorentz force. But in any case, I get something like this. And... Um, and this is sort of then where you say like, okay, yeah, that's great. And we have twice uh, the force. Um, and then, you know, you can imagine that, uh, okay, we get two uh, photons that um, that run away with, um, with the energy there. But that, that's really where you go like, can we do that? Can we, um, and this is the thing, well, what I assume here is that the positive um, elementary charge in a, in a positron uh, and the, the this is what I write here, that that's the same as minus uh, the negative charge in an electron. And this is where I'm going like, maybe we are comparing like uh, apples and oranges there. Positive charge is, uh, you know, positive charge. And minus a positive charge is is not... Uh, is not a negative minus a positive charge is not a negative charge um, but what is it then physically can we represent it somehow um, you will say this is a it is crazy that you don't accept that minus uh, the elementary charge the negative elementary charge is not equal to you know the positive elementary charge i say no electrons and positrons are different and that's where i'm going like uh, and i'm very hesitating very much now is that um you know when this happens um in in standard theory is not described but they're going to say like okay the posi the, this positronium or maybe some virtual uh, particle um, the, the Z0 boson, a neutral uh, intermediate vector boson. And then um, what's going to come out of the collision is going to be a photon, but I'm wondering, is it a real photon? Is it only a field? Or is it maybe, um, you know, also some kind of intermediate vector boson? And what are intermediate vector? Well, they're like photon, they're photon-like, but the difference is that they carry charge. Uh, w plus and W minus, they, they carry the positive and negative charge. And that's where I'm thinking, like, you know, maybe there's a lot of stuff going on um, that is um, that is not well represented. Two photons might carry charge. And I'm saying this because, um, you know, you can look at my papers on ResearchGate. I look at sort of well, what happens in bubble chambers. Um, matter and antimatter... Um, you know, I think there is some kind of charge conservation going on or sloppy accounting. Uh, the, the thing that you need to know, and this is what I put here, is that um, antimatter is not like primary matter. Uh, we get antimatter here, these, um, well, it's very tiny here, we get two positrons and we get two uh, electrons. When uh, a proton hits um, an atmospheric molecule, which is oxygen or... or um, or nitrogen or whatever and then it forms peons uh, a shower a shower of particles uh, and all kinds of funny things happen and these then fall um, apart in you know some positrons and electrons and you know globally uh, charge conservation worked because there's an equal number of uh, positrons and electrons and I think well these uh, where did they come from they must come from you know an ionized atmospheric molecule uh, it loses an electron and then maybe something happens with the nucleus a neutron ejects um, maybe some negative charge this is where I'm going to the next page is um, my model of um, you know this is the standard model of um, yeah let me go to this picture here this is classical picture where um, you know in, in uh, modern uh, quantum uh, electrodynamics quantum chromodynamics uh, they say like well you know a proton and a neutron, uh, when they collide at very high energies, we get uh, this virtual particle, this intermediate vector boson, 
which I said is like is like a photon but short lived and uh, it disintegrates. It disintegrates um, you because this picture comes from Wikipedia in an electron, and um, you know an electron neutrino, well an anti neutrino, and then nobody knows what the difference is really between a neutrino and an anti neutrino. But somehow you know it's um, for parity. Or other uh, conservation laws, weird conservation laws. We uh, we must have that extra degree of freedom where we can put a, a bar on top of uh, uh, the symbol for um, electron neutrino. Um, the reality is that uh, you know there's going to be a shower of other particles, hadrons, um, which are, consist of quarks, and these then integrate into you know the the whole process is actually um, conserves con conserves uh, charge and um, and of course linear momentum and angular momentum. But then that linear and angular momentum is packed into you know all kinds of weird quantum numbers, um, basically uh, quarks and gluons. I, I I call them quantum numbers because they are hypothetically um you know there are like new quantities we invent to make um to make these uh, particle um equations come out all right um maybe that's your view of reality i think we probably um can describe these processes at a, um in a more realist classical way by um not using uh, these weird uh, um oops let me move that back. Okay. Um, not using this weird um, quark gluon theory and saying, well, a proton is a U, a U, and a D quark, and a neutron is a D, and a D, and a U quark, an up quark, and two down quarks. Uh, maybe uh, I'm showing this here. This is a, a how they uh, think um, a helium a nucleus uh, looks like. Um, what we see is uh, not not quarks and gluons. We we basically do see, you know, two protons, uh, two neutrons, and you know, from scattering experiments when we we do fire photons or other charged particles um, at it, we will get they will scatter back, and from there we can determine a charge radius. And um, it's about one point. Uh, it's a bit less than one point seven femtometer, which is two times the size of um, you know the measured radius of of a proton. As said, we don't see anything there that uh, suggests um, you know that quarks would be real. And I don't think there's any need for that. We can um, we can think of a neutron as a, and a proton. I said there's various proton models around, but we can also use the the Tittebewegung theory to sort of say like, uh, yeah, maybe there's a tiny charge circulating at high speed. Um, we have a different, um, but I talk about that. It's four times h bar, and then also you know on tangential velocity, uh, which is given by the radius of the uh, oscillation, the charge oscillation and the frequency and then you arrive at what the proton radius um, actually is measured to be it's four times uh, h bar divided by the proton mass this time times c and um, so you get a, a very natural model that explains um, the magnetic moment of a proton that explains why it has this size uh, uh, about 0 0.4841 uh, femtometer etc etc and um, and I'm going like um, you know this quark gluon um, hypothesis has close to zero um, predictive power in the sense that uh, what does it explain that we can't explain you know in terms of classical physics and ring current models and and what have you and so um, from the whole this is the standard model now where we have a leptons a first and a second generation uh, I think the the first generation is just you know stable. A stable, um, an electron is stable, uh, and electron neutrinos, um, we don't see them fall apart. Second, third generations are highly unstable. Their lifetimes are, are hugely different. So these are oscillations that are slightly off, and after a while, they um, they must fall apart because they do not respect the uh, Planck-Einstein relation, which is um, they're not the oscillation inside of them or the combination of uh, rotations and oscillations inside uh, is not a multiple number of uh, Planck's quantum of action and the frequency of these things I'm sorry I should not have I'm making a mess yeah times the frequency um, you can write it as an angular frequency vector but that's not necessary 
Um, then I would have to make a, you know, also call h some kind of vector which I could. Uh, and make a vector cross product, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so, um, yeah, that's where I am a little bit in my thinking. Is um, I, I think this uh, this classical interpretation uh, that is possible uh, through the the bewegung interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics, which uh, you know in the 90s uh, was was revived by by David Heston, isn't it? that's not a crackpot scientist like me. Well, I don't think I'm a crackpot scientist, but uh, he also thinks that um, you know, there's no need to make things um, uh, too complicated and go to, um, you know, I put two cartoons here, uh, Saint Schrödinger, the forgotten uh, disciple. Um, as long as the tomb is closed, Jesus is both alive and dead. I, I think that's the problem of modern quantum physics, is that they don't think about, um, you know, they, they think about uh, protons and, and electrons and and neutrons as sort of uh, infinitesimally small particles with, with no properties except, uh, you know, that they consist of quarks. Uh, and these quarks then, uh, you know, a lot of properties get loaded on them, but they sort of miss the fact that maybe we could just analyze electrons, protons, and neutrons as, um, you know, oscillations of the elementary charge, and we don't need these funny colors. And um, But so uh, I think uh, modern quantum physics actually does not open the tomb. Uh, well, it's not a tomb, but doesn't sort of look uh, beyond um, um, the obvious, uh, or yeah, beyond the obvious, because it's kind of obvious for me that this uh, bewegung or classical interpretation of quantum mechanics makes sense. And so, as long as you don't do that, you know, you are in this fairy world where things are, you know, can be in multiple states, and instead of uh, you know doing what you should be doing, is uh, superimposing. Uh, adding uh, forces and fields and thinking about you know structures and where things are uh, or could be uh, you know then uh, you're in this fairy world where um, yeah things are both alive and dead or shooting a scat and um, I don't know why that is so why um, uh, Einstein complained about it um, a lot of people had difficulties with it even uh, you know the third generation of quantum physicists um, uh, John Stuart Bell and all that said at the end of his life there must be some better theory but I think that's the um, dynamics of modern science I would say where indeed a 21st century scientist you know his worry is about I must get a result that fits the narrative uh, so I can get my paper into an A journal uh, or in, into nature uh, preferably and so sometimes I feel like the crazy real theory uh, you're on the crazier explanation where people go like, whoa, then, uh, you know, you have more chances of getting attention. And um, but it's not necessarily uh, making um, things um, right. Uh, I think Nobel Prizes have been given to, you know, experiments that, um, you know, they say that last year they apparently discovered that uh, the, the the mass of these virtual uh, particles, but the intermediate vector bosons, is actually not what the standard model predicted. And so they they, they seem to be in the same uh, thing like the explanation of the anomaly of the magnetic moment, where experiments and theory need to be constantly adjusted to to match each other. Um, I'm uh, I'm lucky. Uh, I'm not a, a, an academic, so. Um, and I do have a beard, but I don't look this old. I'm thinking, like, I must find the explanation, a common sense explanation for this phenomenon in Orly to truly understand nature. That's a whole different thing than saying, I must get a result that fits into my narrative so I can get my paper into nature. Or, um, for the theoretical theorist, I must get, you know, a very fancy narrative uh, explaining some unexplained results so I can get my paper into nature or some other uh, A-journal. Um, I'm doing uh, what um, this, uh, this cartoon says. Uh, I want to understand nature, and I think an understanding is possible in terms of, um, you know, these ring current models of uh, of, uh, of matter particles, and uh, also this this very simple uh, photon model, which I present here, um, which which is um, which is nothing. I mean, it's just 
electromagnetic radiation, but then thinking like, okay, electromagnetic uh, wave, well, what is it really? It's photons. Where are the photons? They're always at some point uh, uh, in space, at some point in time. So, um, and that's then what happens. We have this oscillating electric and magnetic field vectors. And um, for me, that makes sense. And it explains why, you know, a number of symmetries that we think should be there aren't actually there because, you know, the mirror world, as I said, when you swap, uh, when you look at um, you know, certain symmetry operations, when you do them, well, you will not um, have something that, not necessarily something that makes sense because you have this very fundamental uh, asymmetry in nature, which is the electromagnetic force itself. It's a right-handed force. And um, and I think some of the transformations that are being done um, probably um, mess uh, mess around with that fact, and that's why you know certain reactions are not reversible. And I don't think much more uh, of that. Did I? Um, no, I can't clean up my notebook. It's kind of the thing is I uh, an, um, an even an older paper I think was one that I actually wrote on this. Uh, you know, quark gluon theory, and I jokingly said, like, uh, you know, soon we will have to explain something else, I guess, and then red, green, blue colors will not be enough, though, so that maybe we can mix them and have, like, uh, yellow and magenta and, and cyan, and, you know, you, you can go... Um, you can go further and further, and I'm, I'm, um, uh, I wanted to uh, jot down some more things that... Uh, but, you know, this uh, RGB uh, color television, red, green, blue, and then we mix the colors, and they need to make white. I'm going, like, seriously? Is that, um, is that highbrow physics? Um, for me, it is... Uh, I, I, I see that, you know, okay, I see formulas that somehow... Um, make sense and then totally don't. Um, what does this red color mean? And then um, these quarks and gluons also, they're supposed to, uh, they, they need to be there to ferry around um, energy and momentum between between what? Uh, so you mix um, between charges. Um, and so so the, the weak force, there's also such a funny concept. I said I can see that, you know, we could have virtual uh, particles, intermediate vector bosons, which would be sort of like um, uh, this is something maybe I didn't I didn't show um, or explain. This is the picture of a, of an electron by uh, Vassalo Celani and uh, Di Tommaso, uh, who work on a lot of interesting things. They basically said like you know what happens um, is we have this ring current and uh, a charge that goes around, zips around at speed of light. When we um, when the electron moves uh, in uh, some direction, what happens is actually uh, this uh, tangential vector, uh, velocity vector c gets some uh, linear component. So it's not only c in the y and the z direction. Sorry, c in the y and the sorry v in the y. Well, it would be c. Yeah? Uh, but there's a, a velocity component in the z direction. Uh, there's one in the y direction, and now there is one uh, in the x direction, which is not equal to uh, zero. So that means that uh, these ones here, um, they can no longer be the only two components of a velocity vector, um, an orbital velocity or tangential velocity. So we have three components now, and it means that the radius of the, um, you know, at a certain speed, 0 0.43 or whatever they have here and you know the faster it goes the more um the more uh, of the momentum i would say of this uh, bewegung charge is taken away by the the the, the lateral uh, velocity and then you wonder like would it be possible that this thing actually goes at the speed of light i mean it would take a lot and a lot and a lot a lot a lot of energy um and um, you don't you don't see that in accelerators we never quite accelerate an electron to uh, light speed we we have it at 99% uh, or even more 99.5% but i could imagine that you could have an electron uh while well, it's a bewegung charge that actually has no energy anymore in the in the uh, y and the z direction and all of its energy would be in its linear uh, motion so that would make then for uh, um, 
what I write here, a W plus boson, there would be no difference whatsoever. The behavior would be photon-like in the sense that it reaches uh, uh, the speed of light or near speed of light. Um, there might still be, even if the tip wing just spins around its own axis, um, that might explain why it never quite reaches the speed of, of, um, of light. So, but it would be almost uh, photon-like. And on top of that, um, this is an electron. Uh, it would have negative charge or for a positron um, when we accelerate it and sort of, um, you know, all the energy from its orbital motion, um, well, this, its total energy is not enough to give it any uh, orbital motion anymore. It all goes in the linear uh, motion. Then, uh, yeah, then you can have... Um, intermediate vector bosons, these, these virtual particles, uh, they could exist. So that makes sense to me, but please don't tell me. Uh, and here I'm coming back to um, uh, my theory is, uh, do you really need that to sort of say that um, this explains some weak force uh, and it explains why uh, things uh, disintegrate? Um, A force, uh, its idea itself is that it acts on a charge. So we have the electric magnetic force, which acts on an electric charge. So a weak force would have to act on some kind of weak charge. What is it that has never been defined? We we a force usually, you know, uh, keeps things together or um, explains why things are um, fall apart, uh, are pushed apart. But just things that disintegrate, uh, temporary disequilibrium states in which you know the parts of the system um, are not in sort of a, an oscillation that respects the Planck-Einstein relationship. Well, that, uh, yeah, that thing is going to disintegrate after a while into, uh, you know, uh, components that do respect the Planck-Einstein relation. And, um, so the weak force I can see, um, you know, indeed, uh, a Z0 boson or a, a W plus and a W minus boson and sort of, uh, you know, that would explain, uh, uh, for the Z boson, when we combine these to a uh, neutral current or a positive uh, or a negative current without using, but actually using um, electrons and positrons, I mean, Zeta-Bewegung charge inside of them. But uh, why a weak force? The same thing goes for the nuclear uh, force. Um, when you really drill down, I talked about in my previous lectures, is, um, you know, these, uh, when you think of... Uh, protons as being ring currents and, and, and nuclear particles, you know, the, the scale is so small and the, um, the dipole moment, the magnetic dipole moment is, is so enormous that, um, and we also know that dipole uh, forces, you know, electric or magnetic dipole are uh, a spherical asymmetric. Uh, so that's where I can see that, you know, oh, there must be some nuclear force uh, it's uh, gigantic, but, you know, it could be the electromagnetic force and the asymmetry, you know, the fact that this force dies off um, beyond a certain distance, which is usually um, one-fourth of the proton radius. So the four falls away, that's about 0 0.21 femtometer. That's what, um, what was it that Japanese scientists thought, that, you know, we have a nuclear force that falls off. Uh, with the with the with the with the distance and and it falls off very very quickly uh, at this distance almost to the point that it's uh, near zero, uh, much quicker than the usually one over r square relation um, that we have for the electromagnetic force. You know, if you have a dipole field, that's um, yeah, you're gonna have a factor one over r three or whatever. In any case, if you posit that uh, you know there's a nuclear force, you should have some nuclear charge right and we don't have that we have a positive and negative electric charges but a nuclear charge you know we would have to have uh, invent a unit and and where is that charge and is it on top of the electric charge or around it and you know an electromagnetic charge would it have like one unit call it like one einstein or one dirac or um or, or whatever but you know we would have to invent a new uh, physical dimension for it and uh, I don't see, and that's where the you know weak force, nuclear force. I'm going like in which um, 
physical dimension do you measure that newton of course but you know the charge that it acts on uh, is it the electric charge uh, it must be because you don't have any other charge uh, that is there the weak charge would be the weinberg or the or or his colleagues the the salam um, and there was a third one uh, i don't remember in any case you know you you would need to invent a new unit a new charge if you want to say that there's a new force then you know you also need to tell me on which charge this force is going to act and then you know you will have a weak field and you will have a nuclear field and you know you you really double or triple um, you know, you would have to have similar uh, equations like those of Maxwell for the electromagnetic force and, and, and a lot of things that, um, to me, um, logically, philosophically, uh, you know, don't get any attention at all uh, in, these, uh, in these weird theories. And that's where I'm going to stop. Um, I said this might uh, seem to be a bit of a... Um, you know, weird, uh, weird talk. Um, it is, uh, but I want to show you what uh, what keeps me awake, and uh, most of all, you know, I um, you know, my brain never stops, and I hope uh, you know I should get the job soon again, so I have less time to spend uh, in the evening to think about weird things like this. But I hope it helps you to sort of make sense of um, of the universe and 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 what is there, and uh, and indeed sort of these weird. Uh, uh, things like um, you know quarks that you can't see, but you know, and experiments, experiments provide you know ninety or ninety-five uh, percent chance that this or that model, uh, standard model, um, is is actually true. And then a few years later, they find out well the measurements and the hypothesis or this or that doesn't fit in, and so you have a lot of uh, ad hoc to your theories. And um, and I don't think that's the the way to go. Uh, when you want to understand things, is uh, you can dive into uh, whatever ad hoc theory. And for for grand unifi unification theories, I have the same the same thing. You know, uh, gravity. Uh, you know, Einstein said that is uh, is probably um, another um, um, geometry, uh, another one than our Cartesian uh, ge uh, geometry of three D space. Uh, it's like an object comes with its own space and it's a curved space for me that's quite natural and then we have the electromagnetic force and we have relativity theory and um for me that that's um, that's enough as a unified theory and we have gravity um i said more of a property of the the space that comes with massive objects and then we have a mass generating mechanism basically says you know what is mass is the equivalent uh, mass of the energy that is in the oscillation of of a charge that's maybe one thing i, I want to note sort of for um before finishing is um is the the electromagnetic nature of of mass uh, i think that's an equation i quickly jotted down in the previous um presentation let me look at uh, i do so i have some paper notes here um yeah but it's this one so we have um uh, the Compton radius uh, of of uh, of an electron, which is uh, h uh, divided by uh, the equivalent, sorry, the mass of the electron uh, times c, and um, then we also have, I said, the uh, Compton scattering, elastic and inelastic, and also our model and the anomaly in the magnetic moment. We assume that the um, Titubuating charge inside of a you know a discharge that goes around and around that it does have some physical dimension because we have actually a little bit of a larger uh, magnetic moment than you know a theoretical current uh, that is a, the the a current of a point like charge really would give and we think that the size of that um, um, uh, the titubuating charge inside of an electron when you make it really bigger uh, you zoom in into this thing here and then. You would see something like that. Alpha 0 0.07, a bit less than 1% of um, the uh, radius of the electron as a whole. And now the um, the funny thing is, um, if alpha, you know, it's defined since the, the, the well, longer, I think it was even before the 2018-2019 revision of, um, of SI units, uh, is defined as... Um, 
you know, the elementary charge squared uh, divided by 4p, uh, the electric constant, uh, h uh, bar c. So um, this thing here uh, should be equal to, if we replace that, um, we have alpha ah, yeah, from this let me see how i get the derivation um ta -ta -ta. ah yeah from this i'm sorry i haven't prepared this one from this basically i get hc and i want to uh, why do i want hc i get hc is um qe squared divided by alpha four yeah, so I move HC there and I move alpha there. So I can, um, what can I do with that? Da, 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 da. Ah, yeah, okay, I need one more, one more step here. I see why I want HC. So if we say uh, we want that mass factor out, we want to really prove that all mass is electromagnetic. So as a first step, we're gonna we're gonna say that there's a, a, a Zeta-Bewegung charge uh, is alpha times the mass. We're gonna replace that by the energy divided by c square. Uh, we still have the h, and then we have the c, and then okay, we have h c. So um, the elementary um, Sorry, the, the theta bewegung charge, the core inside of an electron, is alpha times uh, h bar c. And we showed here that h bar c is um, q e squared divided by alpha 4p, uh, the electric constant. So the, our alpha goes away. And uh, of course, we should have uh, what is left. Um, hc we replace the alpha goes away we still have the energy yeah one divided by the energy and so what do we have then is we want to show that the energy is all electromagnetic so it would be equal to we move the electric uh, the i ah, would be the energy times Let me um, clean up a bit. The energy we move to the other side. So we have Re times the energy. Of the electron, of course, yeah. Is equal to um, Qe square divided by 4p sigma and um, yeah we can then move the radius to the other side hmm? so we have the radius but this formula shows basically that the energy of the electron right not I'm not the energy of the tip wagon charge but as a whole uh, you know, the only things that are in there are the elementary charge squared, the electric constant, and then we have a length. Uh, the uh, This little tiny uh, dimension of the Zeta-Bewegung charge. And it shows basically that, um, you know, this energy, of course, is going to have an, an, uh, an equivalent mass. So we might substitute it by, uh, by m. Mm? divided by e as mc square uh, so we can bring a c square here so then we would have the mass of the electron huh? the equivalent mass of the energy is uh, you know expressed solely in terms of electric charge and electric constant and you know the, the velocity of the speed of light squared and this distance um r r e the, uh, the 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 size or the spatial dimension of the Zeta-Bewegung charge, and this shows to me. You will say it doesn't make sense, but I think it's a, a nice formula that shows all of the mass or the energy is uh, is actually electromagnetic. So we don't need a mass generating mechanism where we think that oh, this Zeta-Bewegung charge must have some 
zero non-zero rest mass no um, uh, there is a mass generating mechanism in this electron model that um, um, shows uh, you know it's consistent with 2018 uh, 2019 revision of SI units again where we define the, the kg and the unit of mass in terms of a uh, um, uh, you know quantities like that Planck's quantum of action uh, the charge uh, um, you know electromagnetic theory but there's no mass is not uh, uh, no longer since the revision of SI units uh, a fundamental constant of nature no it uh, depends on the others it depends and it's all variables that come from electromagnetic theory this is also why I don't believe this weak force uh, electroweak uh, interactions um, or nuclear forces uh, you know, you don't you don't see these in the um, SI uh, system of units, uh, uh, the Standard International. Um, there's nothing there that suggests we would need these um, this kind of hocus pocus to explain reality. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, this has been long enough. Uh, let me check. Uh, well, one hour and a half again. So that's the same as um, yesterday. And uh, I can feel after one and one hour and a half, I tell myself I should stop rambling. Uh, I wish you a very nice evening, um, and I will upload this and then see uh, what happens. Uh, thank you if you've um, watched this till the end. Um, that that's really an achievement, I would say. But I guess it's only gonna be like um, alpha times uh, the total number uh, of people who started watching this video. So 0 0.007 um, a fraction like that. In any case, if you made that fraction, uh, great, congratulations.